Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. And thank you to those who are live streaming us for spending your early evening with us. My name is Peter Phillips. And I am the executive uh, director of the Alternative Dispute Resolution Program here at New York Law School. As many of you know, we uh, make an effort to reach out to the professional ADR community here in New York and the environs by holding continuing legal education opportunities uh, monthly basis anytime the school is in session. Uh, our next one and the last one for the fall term will be held on Wednesday, the 15th of November, when the chief legal officer and senior vice president of the American Arbitration Association, Eric Tuckman, will be joining us to fill us in on legal developments of domestic and international arbitration in the last uh, year or so. Eric, in addition to being a person of some accomplishment uh, and charm, is also a graduate of New York Law School, and we're very proud to, to welcome him back. Uh, the schema of international commercial dispute resolution is one that I have always found uh, uh, elegant, uh, effective, and uh, intriguing. And I look forward to hearing uh, recent developments in that area. New York Law School for many years now has been a participant in the VIS International Commercial Arbitration Moot, and our, our team has been working along with 350 other teams <laughs> to learn the uh, intricacies of this year's arbitration problem. And uh, uh, we, we have high hopes going to Vienna next March. But for tonight, let me introduce the director of the New York International Arbitration Center, Rekha Rangachari. Hi, everyone. We are thrilled to be here. Peter, thank you so much for the invitation. <laughs> Um, we have a lot to cover in quick speed, but what I thought I would do first and foremost is give you a little bit background on NIAC to not be presumptuous. Um, NIAC was founded 10 years ago, so we are in our decennial year. It was founded with this idea to be an institution that supported the application of New York law as a choice, the choice of New York seat and the choice of New York venue for which we have hearing space on site. And to bring all of that together through a series of different supporters, first and foremost, the leading founding firms that financially support NIAC, but really provide the basis and the depth of the thought leadership through their practices, predominantly across the Americas. And our speakers today are representative of two of those firms, which is really thrilling to get to build the pipeline. Um, but as we do that too, we've built broader over the years. We've included now expert consultants, economists, and third-party funders to think about how the New York community can speak cohesively together, incorporating lawyers and non-lawyers um, in a space that matters. And so it's really phenomenal to look here now, 10 years strong, um, for what Judge Kay built in that first year as our founding chair. And I do think she would be really proud. We're gonna continue celebrating NIAC in its 10th year in further and subsequent uh, celebrations, including during New York Arbitration Week. NIAC is a co-chair to the events that happen during New York Arbitration Week, November 13th to the 17th. So if you haven't already, please mark your calendars and join us. Many sessions have already posted registrations on the official site, newyorknyarbitrationweek.com. Com, I think, or org. In any case, if you type it in, it should be the top hit. Check back there regularly, but the opening reception on the Wednesday, the 15th of November, is posted at the New York Historical Society, so we hope to raise a glass with you there. But really, the other thing I wanted to get to is how these lovely speakers have scoped our session, which is a lot about what we talk about at NIAC from our first year into this 10th year. Why is New York important? Why is the US important? What are the choice parameters we have 
thoughtful of party autonomy as we scope an arbitration clause, as we go into proceedings and ask for ancillary hope, uh, help from the courts. And then finally, in the enforcement stages with a key eye to the future as well. So we're going to break our session into four parts just to give you a lay of the land into those far parts, pre-arbitration, arbitration proceedings live, post-arbitration award and enforcement, and then finally a look to the future. So as you listen in, think about questions and feel free to pose them in real time. Where possible, we'll try to take questions from the chat, but um, thoughtful that we are here with a live audience. Um, without further ado then, I want to go ahead and introduce our speakers. You'll hear from them in different order and we have a polling question after I introduce them to kick us off and get us into it. So let's do it. Right next to me, we have Roberta Merrily. She's from Cleary Gottlieb Seen in Hamilton. She joined the firm in 2021 and focuses her practice on enforcement, litigation, and arbitration. Next to her and a colleague as well at Cleary, Maria Mangi joined in 2021 as well. Her focus is on international litigation and arbitration with a Latin American focus. Um, and then we have Nicole Martin from Debo Voice and Plimpton. She joined in 2020, an associate in the litigation department Last but not least, Hiroko Yamamoto of Devo Voice in Plimpton as well, joined in 2021 as an associate in the International Dispute Resolution Group and worked previously in other big law environs. And the reason I stated their years of joining is because regardless of whether they're at their initial firm post-graduation or otherwise, they are very deeply entrenched in the questions we're going to pose to you, in the phases that we're going to pose to you. And so their feedback and insights is really going to help us build this dialogue. But it is a dialogue. Um, so again, questions are really helpful to get us through this. Most importantly, before we get into it, we have a polling question. We have some folks in the room, so we're gonna do it by a show of hands. And the question goes, are US or New York courts becoming more or less pro-arbitration over the past 10 years? So more pro-arbitration, raise of hands. Five. Six, the majority. <laughs> um, but let's take the poll. Less pro-arbitration over the past decade. Okay, so um, just so you have it here in the polling, um, seems that the audience believes, and we're gonna test them at the end to see if they hold true to that, that over the past decade, we have become more pro-arbitration. With that, let's get into it. Um, and we're gonna go into the first segment. Before an arbitration, what happens? why choice is really important here, why folks choose New York law, US law, um, New York is a seat. And so to take us into the seat conversation, this tells us a lot. Um, institutions often will report on who picks which seat. I'm happy to report that in the United States, New York under the ICC parameters, under their latest report has been selected as the most consistently selected US jurisdiction, US seat, city and state. Um, but with that, let's go to it. Roberta, can you tell us why this choice matters and how it involves New York and the U.S.? Right. So maybe, uh, well, before I get started, just want to thank you uh, for the introduction and say that I'm really excited to be here on this panel with friends and colleagues and with those uh, in person here and, and online. Um, but Maybe let me start by overwhelming you with some more statistics, uh, building off of what Reka just started. Perfect. With. We like statistics. <laughs> it pushes the conversation, please. Um, all of which uh, will show that the U.S. and New York in particular is uh, one of parties' favorites when it comes to um, seats uh, for arbitration. So according to the 2022 Queen Mary report, New York is the sixth most popular seat for arbitration worldwide. Unsurprisingly, New York is particularly attractive to parties from certain regions, right? So in, in the Caribbean, Latin America region, New York actually emerges as the second most preferred uh, arbitral seat, uh, capturing 54% of, of respondents' preference. Uh, if the ICC is any indication, um, as Rika was saying, the U.S. is actually tied with France for a top two uh, country for ICC arbitrations, uh, and New York uh, is among the most frequently selected cities there as well. Now, if we focus on the U.S., uh, also uh, based on not only ICC, but also uh, AAA ICDR, so 
uh, International Center for Dispute Resolution Statistics, New York is by a landslide, the most frequently used venue uh, in the US for international arbitrations. And since I'm already rattling down all these statistics, let me just bring in one more, uh, which is that US nationals, and this might be interesting for those of you who are practicing or interested in practicing, um, represent the second highest selected category of arbitrators worldwide after UK nationals. Now that's probably more statistics than we can absorb uh, tonight. Uh, so let me just go over a few reasons why parties so often like to choose New York uh, as a seat for their arbitration. Well, first, New York courts uh, have a strong policy in favor of arbitration. Uh, second, New York is a major uh, global commerce hub, right, with the highest number of Fortune 500 company headquartered here and, and also smaller outfits. So that becomes really important when we think about immediate access to parties and to assets. Uh, third, and, you know, that probably comes by, by uh, implication as well. Uh, New York has a very well-developed and predictable body of commerce law that parties can rely on. And I know lawyers usually like to talk in threes, but uh, if you allow me, I'll give a few more reasons. <laughs> uh, a, a fourth reason is that New York has a deep uh, pool of, of professionals with a diverse set of skills uh, and also uh, well-schooled in arbitration and uh, fifth, and I think this is something Reka already touched on, uh, New York has great facilities, right? Great infrastructure to hold not only small, but also large and, and complex hearings, including the wonderful facilities at NIAC. So that's something that parties often look for, especially if we're thinking about technology, modern state of the art. Um, now, I know we're going to touch on a number of of topics uh, that get into uh, you know why this seat, why New York uh, is is important, or why the the choice of a seat is so important. I want to just highlight two of the the reasons I mentioned why a lot of parties choose New York as a seat. Both of those related to the law, right? So often. Um, the seat where uh, the arbitration takes place ends up becoming important because uh, courts may be called upon to make important decisions, such as on interim relief or enforcement and recognition of arbitral awards. And so these are just a few of the, the topics that I think we'll, we'll probably cover later uh, on tonight. So just wanted to highlight those as well. A weighty nature, the choice of seat. But that will also implicate if we take us through a hypothetical that Hiroko is going to help me through with. So New York is the choice for the seat. Um, a party anti-arbitration goes to federal court. And so who gets to decide the competence, competence, the jurisdictional narrative? Is it the court or is it the tribunal that will be seized with this matter? Hiroko, where, where do we go from here in New York? Yeah, before I um, get started on the scenario, I just want to thank Peter for including us on the wonderful ADR program and Reka for including us in the, the, the centennial celebrations. Happy birthday to Nayak. Um, and thank you all for taking the time out of your busy Wednesdays to um, spend the next um, 80 minutes with us. So going back to your hypothetical, Reka, so the concept of competence, competence, or competence, competence with a K and a Z at the end in the German term, as we typically refer to, um, is the idea that the tribunal is the one that gets to decide whether the arbitral tribunal has jurisdiction. And it's often associated with being arbitration friendly to have competence, competence. And that's because you're recognizing the tribunal's power to, to decide on its jurisdiction. You don't need to go separately to a court. And so it's both efficient and autonomous. The U.S. and New York approach has continued to be what was set out in the 1995 case, First Options versus Kaplan. Um, that has been the continued approach of New York federal courts as well. So there, the court has the power to decide unless there is, quote, clear and unmistakable evidence that the parties agreed to have arbitrability decided by the arbitrator. And so this stands in contrast with a lot of the arbitration-friendly jurisdictions who, which do recognize arbit, um, competence, competence, like France, England, Singapore, 
and the 88 states under the 2006 Uncitral Model Law. But the US approach is not necessarily inconsistent with being arbitration friendly. At bottom, it's a question about contractual interpretation. To avoid protracted litigation on this threshold issues, a lot of parties choose to in explicitly state in their arbitration clauses that an arbitral tribunal can decide the scope of its own jurisdiction. And US courts have generally held that the adoption of major arbitral rules like the AAA, the ICC, the UNCITRAL, that expressly provide for competence competence is enough of a clear and unmistakable evidence. Notably, the 2023 case in the Second Circuit, the All In Holdings v. Libya case, recognized this concept in the context of investor state dispute where the BIT referred to the ICC and the ICC ruled specify competence competence. On the other hand, when the arbitration clause includes specific carve outs, that does not constitute unmistakable evidence of arbitrability um, set to be decided by the tribunal. And a last thing I note, the notable development here in the past 10 years is the wholly groundless exception to the first options rule. Until 2019, some federal circuits had held that if the defendant's argument for arbitration is wholly groundless, then the district court itself can resolve the threshold question of arbitrability. The intent of this is to block frivolous attempts to take a court litigation into arbitration. So by saying that the court can decide the issue of arbitrability in the courts themselves, you can't even go to arbitration. So you're blocking that those kinds of frivolous attempts. However, in the 2019 Supreme Court decision, Henry Schein, the wholly groundless exception to arbitrability is, was found to be inconsistent with the FAA, which says that you have to look at the arbitral agreement itself and also with Supreme Court precedent, which prohibits a preliminary or potent, uh, an assessment of the potential merits of the ruling. So again, this really goes to um, specifying that the, the party's agreement is very important and the party's intent expressed in the agreement is very important, which is not inconsistent with being arbitration friendly. So as we look to competence, competence, we can find it within the incorporated procedural rules provided there's no carve out. We can find it in the applicable national law or the Federal Arbitration Act as it pertains to the US um, and other directives within the arbitration clause, but it has to be clear and unmistakable so that we remain a pro-arbitration seat, right? So that there is clear consent and indication. Let's tease out this arbitrability reality further. Let's look at some trends. So Nicole, I'm curious here, what trends, what cases? We're doing the decennial, so let's look back 10 years, why not? And what have you really seen about this idea of compelling arbitration for courts staying and dismissing actions to go to court, parallel proceedings, anti-suit injunctions, all of this like? Are we really, in the past decade, have we maintained our pro-arbitration stance that Hiroko has been speaking about? Sure. Thanks, Rika. And thank you, Peter, um, echoing the thanks all around. Um, so. I would say that the posture of US and New York based courts has tended to be pretty pro arbitration and has maintained that consistently over the past um, 10 years. Um, and I would maintain that that makes the US and New York more specifically um, a favorable arbitral forum as we've all kind of alluded to. Um, before I get deeper into the case law and the trends, um, Hiroko and Reika, you both mentioned the FAA, so I just wanted to give a little reminder, and for those that might be law students um, um, on the Zoom, that the Federal Arbitration Act is the main statutory umbrella that gives courts the power to compel arbitration um, and stay parallel litigation. Under the FAA, if an arbitrable issue is brought before any court in the US, that court must stay the court action. And the FAA also then gives the court the power to compel the parties to arbitration. Um, these provisions apply to all arbitrations, domestic and international, um, and they can be invoked by state and federal courts. Um, so now getting more into the trends, if you look at US and New York federal state and case law, um, federal and state case law, 
applying the FAA, even in just the past year, and certainly in the past 10 years, you'll find many more cases granting motions to compel um, arbitration and staying parallel litigation than you will find motions to compel that have been denied. Now, of the cases that I surveyed just in the past year, so almost 50, um, where the courts decided motions to compel under the FAA, over 75% of those cases, um, in, in those cases, the court granted the motions. Um, now, this is unsurprising because the standards that the courts apply when deciding motions to compel inherently favor arbitration. So if a plaintiff moves to compel arbitration and makes a prima facie showing that the arbitration agreement exists, then the burden shifts to the defendant um, to show that the agreement is inapplicable or invalid for some reason. Um, if the defendant can't make that showing, then the court will grant the motion. Um, now, anybody who has practiced contract law or for the law students who remember their first year contracts class, arguing that a contract is invalid can sometimes be a pretty tall order. And when you're dealing with contracts that have arbitration clauses, especially in this day and age, they are often written by very sophisticated parties. Um, so you can imagine why many of those cases um, are being granted when they're brought um, through a motion to compel. Um, of the less than 25 cases in the past year that I surveyed that denied motions to compel, only a couple of them were actually denied because the court found an actual contractual deficiency. Um, a couple of the cases were clickbait cases where the court found that part, the parties being compelled to arbitration were found not to have assented um, to the contract. Otherwise, they were cases that were dismissed on some procedural issues like waiver or not providing the court with a proper um, copy of the contract or other very specific carve outs um, that didn't allow for arbitration um, in insurance and ERISA uh, contexts. So all in all, New York federal and state courts, very favorable towards compelling arbitration. And Reka, you also mentioned anti-suit injunctions. So I want to get a little bit into those trends as well over the past 10 years. Um, here too, U.S. courts generally favor arbitration, but they've been a bit more cautious based on international comedy concerns. Um, there isn't a uniform standard for granting anti-suit injunctions across U.S. jurisdictions, um, so this could be an area of future development. Um, but right now, you have some federal courts that take a very conservative approach that will only grant anti-suit injunctions um, where the foreign proceedings totally strip the U.S of um, their jurisdiction or contravene some essential US public policy. And then you have another group of circuits that take a much more liberal approach and tend to grant anti-suit injunctions when allowing um, the foreign proceeding to go forward may prejudice the US parties. So if there's a risk of inconsistent judgments or the proceedings would otherwise be oppressive or inconvenient. New York courts and the second circuit lie somewhere in the middle, but probably trending more towards the liberal side of things. Um, they apply what's known as the China trade test to determine whether an anti-suit injunction is warranted. Um, and so they look at a number of factors, including whether the foreign litigation would frustrate a policy in the enjoining forum, whether um, it would threaten the issuing US court's jurisdiction, as I mentioned, or be oppressive or prejudicial for any number of reasons. Um, and in the past 10 years, the New York courts have tended to decide in favor of granting anti-suit injunctions based on these factors at a rate of over two to one, based on my review of some of the recent case law in the past 10 years. Um, the factor that tends to hold the most sway, which is interesting, is the strong U.S. federal policy favoring arbitration. Um, a really good illustration of this um, is from one of the most recent cases in the past 10 years, um, Citigroup v. Seed, which was decided by SDNY in January 2022. Citigroup asked the court to compel arbitration against a former employee of one of their Mexican subsidiaries. That employee had challenged his termination and withholding of certain benefits in a Mexican court, and Citigroup wanted to enjoin him from pursuing that action in Mexico and arbitrate instead. 
Um, the court sided with Citigroup primarily based on two factors. Number one, it worried that allowing the Mexican action to proceed would produce inconsistent judgments. And number two, it invoked the strong U.S. federal policy in favor of arbitration, which it said applies with particular force in international disputes. So it seems like the Second Circuit and New York federal courts tend to lean more liberal, which may in turn support the desirability of New York as an arbitral forum. Okay, so one more aspect as we think about pre-proceedings phase is access to justice, right? And finances. And so when we think about that, can you even, do you even have the means to bring a claim third-party fund funding has gained momentum in the international arbitration space. And so let's take a look, Maria, and if you can share with us, how amenable have the New York courts been to third-party funding and what is the landscape there? Definitely. And thank you, Rika and Peter, again, for having us all here on this panel. So the rise of third-party litigation funding has been definitely a growing development in the last 10 years. Um, and this rise has occurred even as there's been various procedural and regulatory initiatives, let's say, to cabin and guide its development at the state and federal level in the U.S. and then, of course, abroad. So let's take a step back. What is third party funding? So third party funding is broadly defined as an agreement by an entity that is not a party to a suit. Um, to provide a party with either funds or some sort of material support to finance part or all of that proceeding. The support or financing is usually provided in exchange for some remuneration or some sort of reimbursement that is wholly or partially depending on the outcome of the dispute. Um, this is done through a funding agreement between the funder and the party being funded, and it outlines the conditions for funding and the economics for payments typically referred to as the waterfall. Uh, the party being funded also separately signs an engagement letter with their legal counsel, and there's no attorney-client relationship typically between the legal counsel and the funder, but most funding agreements do include a provision that allow the funder to receive uh, updates from the counsel. So third-party funding in an arbitration context really came up more around 2011 when a code of conduct was created by the Association of Litigation Funders in the UK to guide the application of funding in arbitration. In the decade-ish since, we've seen the acceptance of third-party funding regulation in countries such as Singapore and Hong Kong as well. Um, now here I'll say third-party litigation funding is somewhat controversial. Its supporters claim, like Rick has said, there's an access to justice. It levels the playing field. It allows litigants to bring and continue cases even when they may not have the money personally to finance those claims. Third-party funding also allows companies that actually have the cash, but to pursue those claims while maintaining the cash flow that they need to be a successful business. But there's also critics, uh, and those critics argue that adding an outside third party only complicates the litigation process, including because a funder and a litigant might not always have the same goals and interests in a litigation or an arbitration. And there can be some ethical concerns for the lawyers that represent a party being funded. Um, now, for funders and for other investors, international arbitration is a particularly attractive area of investment because of a few things like the high value of the claims, the speed of the proceedings, the potential for reduced evidentiary cost and discovery, uh, and the high enforceability of arbitral awards. Now, one thing I didn't say there that typically comes up as a pro of arbitration is confidentiality. And that is because a lot of arbitral institutions have recently updated their rules to include disclosure for a third party funder, which is one of the main concerns that funders sometimes have. So for example, the new ICC rules that were issued in 2021 require disclosure of a third party funder. The new draft SEAC rules issued this summer would require any party being funded to include in their notice of arbitration or response, the existence of third party funding, the identity and the contact detail of the third party funder. And the SEAC rules also note that the tribunal can order further disclosure on this funding if it feels that it is necessary. The ICDR rules similarly allow for a party to seek disclosure of a third party funding relationship. One outlier here, the LCIA modified their rules in 2020, but did not include anything about third party funding. So I think we should all keep an eye out on the new LCIA rules if and when they come out to see if they update that. So in the US, 
third party funding is really only regulated at the state level. And in New York, there are very few regulations so far on third party funding in litigation and arbitration, although there is legislation pending before the state Congress that would focus on funding of consumer litigations. Uh, in New York, the main questions that arise for third party funding and making sure it's done properly are questions of champerty and whether the funder controls the litigation. So this is an issue that also arises for lawyers who are representing a party being funded is ensuring that the lawyer only takes uh, directive from their client and not from the funder. So a recent case in both New York federal and state courts was a case between Cisco Corporation and Burford Capital, which was its litigation funder. Cisco received funding from Burford to finance its claims in a separate lawsuit decided it wanted to settle some of those claims and Burford did not consent to the settlements. An LCIA arbitration under New York law ensued between the parties over this issue of control and who had the ultimate say on Cisco entering into settlements. Um, the tribunal granted Burford a temporary restraining order and eventually a preliminary injunction, which barred Cisco from entering those settlements. And it found that Burford did get to consent to settlements under this funding agreement. Um, Cisco moved in Illinois federal court to vacate the award and Burford moved in New York state court to confirm the award, which was eventually removed to federal court. And the issue there was really who controls a litigation, who has the power to take litigation decisions. Um, this court was settled before any court in Illinois or New York got to weigh in, uh, but it stands out as an interesting question about this idea of who controls because there are ethical rules both for lawyers under the ABA and for funders that they shouldn't be causing or bringing about litigation. It should really be intended for an access to justice. Now, there haven't been too many instances so far where New York has weighed in on third party funding um, in arbitration, but in litigation, New York courts are pretty supportive of third party funding as long as, like I said, the funder doesn't stir up or control the litigation itself. And in New York so far, New York's courts have actually leaned against the requiring of disclosure of a third party funding in litigation, which goes against other states. For example, federal courts in the Northern District of California recently began to require that all external funding in class action suits must be disclosed. So like I said, this is a new area in the last 10 years, and I can expect that in the next 10, it will change again, probably. Thanks, Maria. Two foot, Peter. You know, I wanted to pursue that if I could from the perspective of the arbitrator's ethical obligation. Mm -hmm. um, in the absence of disclosure, were I an arbitrator in a matter, I may have a conflict with an undisclosed third party that has an interest in the outcome of the arbitration. And the only way that that can be avoided would be to disclose to me who that third party is in a, in a, a in, in a timely fashion so that we don't go deep into the proceeding only later to discover that I had an unknown conflict with the party. Looked at that way, it, it would seem that it would need to be mandatory that those disclosures take place or else there might be baked into the award a failure to disclose in conflict with the arbitrator. Yeah, I think that's definitely a great point. And that may be part of why we're starting to see so many institutions update their rules to include this disclosure. It's also very possible, like you said, some of the litigation funders that are prevalent in the industry are prevalent in a lot of cases and a lot of arbitrators are practitioners. And so there are very high chances that an arbitrator's firm or an arbitrator themselves is either involved in a case without knowing or knowing that there is a third party funder. Um, I think that's probably part of why now some uh, rules require the disclosure from the get-go in the notice of arbitration, such that it actually may help guide choosing a tribunal. The truth is that it can be a slippery slope, as Maria has pointed out, and we're still waiting on the regs that tell us if disclosure is mandatory, but it goes to the larger question that she raised of control. What is the control factor of the third-party funder? Because by and large, are they exercising decisional realities like selection of the arbitrator, reviewing drafts? Many within that space would argue hard no. But the truth of arbitration is that it is confidential. And in some ways, behind closed doors, what happens is always a curiosity. We see an evolution of procedural rules through the arbitral institutions that marry one another in time. 
the outlier here being the LCIA, for example. But in general, there are these trends because optionality and arbitration is king or queen as you choose to perceive it. Let's get into our next topic. But before I do that, I want to remind everyone this is a CLE program. And so we need some code words. But I also want to point you to in the materials, there is some really thoughtful, substantive material that our speakers have put together with hyperlinks. Please take a look. If nothing else, put it into the folder for when you need it later, um, because it also covers all the um, new law, new federal law that has come into place via SCOTUS and indications, as well as other useful resources. The first code word, um, and you'll have to guess what we're spelling out here, is new. So code word number one, CLE code, <laughs> is new. Our next topical discussion is to take us. So we've started at the pre-proceeding phase. Now we're going into the proceedings. Um, and as much as I said, procedural rules tend to marry one another in some respect. Um, we see this also in terms of the procedural rules that give access to a tribunal to do things that were forever in the past left only to the courts, things like preliminary and interim relief. But we have to consistently think of the ancillary reality of having those courts there. Why do you pick a certain seat? Why do you pick a certain law? And so how is that seat going to help you when the proceedings get going and you need an able assist? And so let's take a look at particularly the preliminary and interim measures narrative, and Hiroko will go to you for that. And then thereafter, Maria, on attaching assets in aid of arbitration. What do each of these tranches look like when we're looking to the New York courts and in general, the US purview? Hiroko? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> as you might be familiar, preliminary and interim relief in support of arbitration um, can be very helpful because if you, if the party can dissipate assets like Maria will touch on, or if the party can continue doing what you're pleading is wrong until the arbitration itself is resolved, that could take a long time. So preliminary and interim measures appear in two ways in conjunction with the court. The first is the tribunal itself orders the relief, but then you go to the court to, because the other side doesn't comply with it and you actually need it enforced. And the second, the court itself orders the relief. And that could be very helpful if the arbitral tribunal has not yet been constituted or if a third party is involved. For example, freezing a counterparty's asset in a bank. I'll provide a quick overview of the preliminary and interim measures uh, mechanism and um, uh, in the U.S. and New York, and then Maria will touch on, on a really key aspect of that, which is the attachment of assets. So the FAA does not explicitly speak to the arbitrator's authority to, for, to issue preliminary relief, but they have continued to generally recognize that, including by the Second Circuit. And it's now become very commonplace for arbitral institutions, including the, like AAA, JAMS, and so forth in the United States to explicitly recognize the arbitrator's authority to issue preliminary relief. To enforce the preliminary relief in US courts, the award must be quote unquote final. And that could be a little bit um, seemingly in conflict with how they're usually issued by the tribunal, which is this interim measure awards but that doesn't preclude it from being enforced. So the interim award has to require some specific action or inaction, and the interim award cannot serve as a basis for a subsequent award, so it should be self-contained. U.S. courts have just interestingly also applied this to emergency arbitrator decisions. So for example, in the 2014 SDNY case of Yahoo versus Microsoft Corporation, the issue involved was about merging the, the service engines, the two, two service engines for, for Yahoo and for Microsoft, also known as Bing. So the emergency arbitrator ordered an injunction that Yahoo needed to use all efforts to complete the transition of the search engines in a short period of time, and SDNY enforced that decision. So second, the second aspect where the court itself orders the preliminary measures. So as a general rule, the preliminary relief and aid of international arbitration will typically be made before the federal courts. So if you look at the Second Circuit, they use a, a multi-factor test that is very comparable to other jurisdictions globally. So you have to be have a likelihood of succeeding on the merits, 
the a likelihood that there'll be an irreparable injury and the balance of hardship tips in your favor and that the public's interest would not be deserved by issuance of the injunction. In a recent case, Benihana versus Benihana of Tokyo, for example, the Second Circuit upheld the decision of the district court to enjoin the Hawaiian branch of the Benihana restaurant from selling hamburgers while the arbitral tribunal proceeded with the arbitration about the breach of a license agreement. So you can see that these preliminary measures has real bite and has real actual practical consequences. Um, Notwithstanding this, in some circumstances, you might need to go to New York State Court or the New York State law um, factors would apply because the federal rules 64 um, directs the federal court to apply the state law if it's related to attachment. So that goes into New York CPLR 7502C which says that New York courts have jurisdiction to issue preliminary measures in support of arbitration, as long as they are necessary to prevent the award from being rendered ineffectual. Um, there's some debate about whether there's other factors that um, have to be complied, but before I, I go deep into that, um, that, that would be kind of a different scope of a whole different scope. So I'll just stop it there and just note that this rule was codified in 2005 following extensive criticism of New York state court decisions stating that they were prevented from issuing attachment orders in support of arbitration. So the legal change ha really happened then and uh, it's been very frequently used. So you can see the real pivot toward becoming pro-arbitration in that sense. Sure, thanks Erica. So as Herko said, one really important way in which the U.S. legal system provides assistance in arbitration uh, is the attachment of assets. And as she said, New York law grants a pretty flexible standard in allowing attachment during or actually even before an arbitration is uh, initiated by a claimant. And federal courts in the U.S. follow the law of the state. Uh, they are located in considering attachment. So why would you attach assets? So as Hiroko mentioned, this can be really important if a respondent is outside of the U.S., but it can also be done in situations where a claimant is concerned that the respondent may be unwilling or unable to pay for a future award, such as if there's a concern that the respondent can become insolvent before the award is collected. Um, so the statute, as Hiroko said, allows um, the opportunity to attach the accounts of prospective award debtors in New York, which is exceptionally important, as Roberta mentioned, because New York is where there are so many financial centers. Um, so the statute permits attachment even if the arbitration proceeding doesn't take place in New York, um, and the claimants have to commence an arbitration within 30 days of the attachment if they have not commenced it already. Um, so in considering whether attachment will be granted, a claimant must meet certain factors. So the claimant has to show first that there is a cause of action. Second, that they will it's probable that they will succeed on the merits. And third, that the amount demanded from the respondent exceeds all the counterclaims that are known to the claimant so that there's a reason to attach. And this likelihood of success, the second prong, like Hiroko mentioned, is similar to things in preliminary measures. Um, when an arbitration has not yet begun or is still ongoing, the claimant is to be given the benefit of all legitimate inferences and deductions that can be made from the facts stated. So similar like to a summary judgment uh, standard. So recently in 2022, the Second Circuit actually um, clarified, let's say, the factors that apply for attachment. So in a case called Iraq Telecom Limited versus IBL Bank SAL in the Second Circuit, an Iraqi company brought an arbitration proceeding against a Lebanese bank for fraud in 2018, which it won in 2021 and received a $3 million judgment. The claimant then initiated a second arbitration against the same parties based on damages resulting from the fraud for an additional $97 million. So while the second arbitration was pending, the claimant brought a motion to enforce the award and for an order of attachments in New York and received an order of attachment of approximately $100 million from the district court based on putting the two arbitrations together. So the respondent obviously opposed the motion and moved to vacate the attachment. Uh, on their review, the district court first lowered the attachment to about $8.5 million 
and found that the claimant's likelihood of success of winning $97 million in the second arbitration was not really that certain. The court then lowered the attachment again to $3 million and focused on the idea of exceptional circumstances. And it found that issuing a higher attachment could force the respondent, which was a Lebanese bank, into insolvency. And then this would have a grave effect on the Lebanese economy. And it also found that the attachment could undermine confidence in New York institutions. So the claimant appealed this order, reducing the attachment, and their argument was that a court could not actually consider any extraordinary circumstances in determining the amount of the attachment. So the Second Circuit took this up, and it found that while no New York courts had ruled on this idea of extraordinary circumstances, and they are to be guided by New York state law, it decided to resolve the ambiguity in the law and found that the courts can indeed use these extraordinary circumstances in considering attachment, and it looked to a few New York state law cases to make that point. However, the Second Circuit did agree with the claimant that the district court had applied these extraordinary circumstances incorrectly in the case at hand, and the court had not properly weighed these extraordinary circumstances by not considering whether there was an amount between $3 million and $100 million that it could have granted as attachment, that those were not the two options. Um, and the Sir Second Circuit also found that the district court had abused its discretion in incorrectly applying the likelihood of success standard because the district court had focused on whether it was conceivable that the claimants would win the second arbitration for $97 million, but the standard is probable, which is higher. Um, the Second Circuit remanded for further consideration. And in January of 2023, the parties agreed to a $17 million attachment. And in May of 2023, the respondent paid the full $3 million that was owed from the first arbitration. Um, as far as I know, and from review of the docket, there has been nothing about the second arbitration. So we don't know if there'll be a second attachment in this case. But it is interesting to consider that courts don't just have to consider what is in front of them on attachment, considering extraneous factors such as the effect on the global economy are important in attachment. Thanks so much. Okay, so we've heard a little bit during proceedings about interim and emergency relief, recalcitrant parties, excuse me, recalcitrant parties and going to the courts. We've also heard about the standards that apply here in order to get attachment, right? So let's move also to a discussion that is a hot topic in addition to those already discussed, um, evidence in aid of arbitration. So there's been a change overall, and so we're gonna go through this narrative, but <laughs> I'm looking here to Roberta. How do U.S. courts treat assisting in evidence in aid of arbitration? Has there been a change recently? What's going on in this mechanism system? Um, now, I'm the, one of the key provisions, right, that, that comes to mind, uh, and I believe that's what Rekha is referring to here, is uh, 28 U.S.C. Section 1782. Have you all heard of 1782 before or from our audience? So I've for, a little bit. For, for those not familiar with it, uh, what Section 1782 does is it empowers U.S. federal courts to authorize discovery from persons or entities residing or located in the district court uh, where the federal court sits for, and here I quote, for use in a proceeding in a foreign or international tribunal. So in other words, parties that are uh, parties to a legal proceeding outside of the US, they can apply to a court in the US to ask that court to get discovery, so get witness testimony, document productions, etc., to then use those in that legal proceeding outside of the US that they're a party to. Now, there's a reason I was quoting from Section 1782, uh, because there's actually been tremendous debate around this phrase, foreign or international tribunal. Uh, so an, until last year, the US Supreme Court's only decision on the scope of Section 1782 and the meaning of this term, foreign or international tribunal, was its 2004 Intel versus AMD case. And in that case, the Supreme Court held that this term, foreign or international tribunal, includes not only judicial proceedings in you know, foreign courts, which that much was clear, that was included in the scope of section 1782, 
but also administrative and quasi-judicial proceedings. So there was clarity, Section 1782 applied to foreign court proceedings and something else, but it wasn't entirely clear what that something else was. And so for our purposes today, as you might imagine, one of the questions that came up is, well, does that something else include international arbitrations? And does it matter whether we're talking about investor state arbitrations or private commercial arbitrations? Now, regarding investor state arbitration, most courts, including the Second Circuit uh, in a 1999 case called National Broadcasting versus Burr Stearns, had generally assumed that Congress had intended to cover investment treaty arbitrations when it adopted Section 1782, not least because sovereigns were involved uh, or are, are generally involved in, in those arbitrations. The situation was more complicated uh, with respect to private commercial arbitrations. So here the second, fifth, and seventh circuits held that Section 1782 discovery uh, was not covered uh, in private commercial arbitrations, whereas the fourth and sixth circuits had ruled that it did. So there was a circuit split. And last year, the Supreme Court resolved this circuit split when it granted cert in what became two landmark cases now, uh, uh, ZF Automotive versus LexShare and uh, Alex Partners versus Fund for Protection of Investors' Rights in Foreign States. That's a long name, so a mouthful. Consolidated uh, case, yeah. Right, so, so the ZF Automotive was a Sixth Circuit case uh, that dealt with a private commercial uh, arbitration before the German Institute of Arbitration, DIS, so a private uh, arbitral institution. And by contrast, the Alex Partners case uh, that one involved a, an investor state arbitration pursuant to a bilateral investment treaty between Russia and Lithuania. So here, one of the parties to this Alex Partners case was this fund that I mentioned, a Russian fund uh, that had initiated the arbitration. Now, the key piece to remember here is that in both cases, the district courts allowed discovery under Section 1782. And the circuit courts then affirmed that. The Supreme Court unanimously reversed both decisions, considering first whether foreign or international tribunal, so that term that I mentioned initially, whether that includes private adjudicative bodies or only governmental or intergovernmental adjudicative bodies. And it found that it only applied to the latter, so only governmental uh, or intergovernmental bodies. And second, uh, it considered whether either of the arbitral tribunals in these two cases, so the DIS uh, tribunal and uh, an ad hoc uncent uncentral uh, uh, panel in the Alex Partners case, whether those fell within this category of uh, governmental or intergovernmental body. And it found that neither did. So that was... An easier question, as you can imagine, for the ZF Automotive case, where the tribunal was created by contract, right? So you had no government power involved. But it was a harder question and maybe a, a more surprising finding for some uh, in Alex Partners, right? Where the arbitration was convened pursuant to a treaty between two governments. So here the court found that the mere presence of a sovereign as a party to this dispute, and the fact that the tribunal shared some features with uh, other bodies that look governmentals, uh, governmental, those, those factors were not dispositive. Instead, the court said what mattered is the substance of the two sovereigns' agreement to arbitrate. So really the question is, did these two nations intend to confer governmental authority on an ad hoc panel formed under their treaty. And so here, the court looked at the bilateral investment treaty between Russia and Lithuania and found that, look, there was no nothing in here that suggests that their intent was for the ad hoc panel to actually exercise governmental authority. And so these decisions, of course, have important implications, as you can imagine. Uh, with respect to private commercial arbitrations, the outcome 
uh, should not uh, have much of a, a, a an impact on New York federal court or, or um, uh, Second Circuit jurisprudence, right, where already um, Section 1782 discovery was not uh, available in those kinds of cases. But investor state arbitrations still raise some questions, right? So as I mentioned, the, the Supreme Court, even though in the Alex Partners case, it found that discovery was not available, it still left the door open um, for situations where sovereigns might imbue an ad hoc arbitrational or arbitral panel with official authority. And so the question is, what form might that take? Uh, now, there are two New York District Court cases um, that I just want to point uh, the audience to in, in case you're interested uh, in, in this topic. Uh, one is INRI Alpine in the Eastern District and INRI Rebuild in the Southern District of New York. Both of these cases pending, uh, both of them held that discovery was not available in exit arbitrations because the panels there looked very much similar to the one in, in Alex Partners. Uh, so it found uh, that those tribunals did not have governmental authority, but we should stay tuned uh, to see what, what happens with those cases. Now, maybe another uh, implication of, of this whole uh, saga, uh, if I may call it that, is that parties might try to rely on other tools to get discovery, right? And, and here I'm, I'm just going to touch on two of those uh, that might become more important. Uh, one is this tool under the Federal Arbitration Act, which allows for arbitral subpoenas uh, for non-party discovery. And another one more specific to New York um, is uh, certain CPLR provisions, CPLR 2302 and 7505, which also allow an arbitrator or an attorney of record to issue subpoenas to non-parties under certain circumstances. Roberta, thank you. Uh, this shows, I think, the pressures, right, that we're going to experience as we continue a discussion on does a jurisdiction remain pro-arbitration? Thoughtful that many jurisdictions don't offer this access to discovery or evidence within the jurisdiction. And so where in the U.S. the Supreme Court has told us, um, yes, but what happens? How does that contour a jurisdiction? Do people end up thinking because of that as a visibility point, it becomes less than pro-arbitration from what it used to be. And so we're going through different iterations. And these are the pressure points, the pain points we want you to keep thinking through because they're developing in real time. But these are recent cases. So recent realities that we've been faced with as we respond to the international community when they ask us, oh, I saw that case. What's your take on arbitration? Which is not as easy to summarize. So we're going into our final tranche of looking at the proceedings in a post-award reality. But before we get there, the second CLE code is York. The first was new. This is York. This is the decennial year of NIAC. <laughs> um, Okay, so let's push. So here we go. Developments that are happening in the enforcement narrative. And so when we think about whether a jurisdiction is pro-arbitration or not, we have to think about the enforcement narrative. Are the courts in that jurisdiction enforcing arbitral awards? And where they're not, what are the rationale for not, right? And so we're going to go to Roberta again and sort of take an overview are the courts in favor of enforcing? Is the US and or New York a desirable place to enforce awards? Thank you, Rekha. So as a general matter, and I think this has come up uh, or has been a, a theme uh, tonight, uh, New York courts and US courts are highly respectful of parties' decisions to submit their disputes to arbitration. The New York Court of Appeals, for instance, has repeatedly emphasized the long and strong public policy in favor of arbitration and reiterated that New York courts try to interfere as little as possible with the freedom of the consenting parties to submit disputes to arbitration. And U.S. Supreme Court as well has been steadfast in affirming the federal uh, policy in favor of arbitration. So. As a result of that, U.S. courts and New York courts in, in particular favor giving effect to arbitration awards and construe the grounds for vacature, so for setting aside an award or making it null or void, uh, very narrowly. 
Uh, even so, uh, or maybe because of that, uh, there's quite some debate about those grounds for vacature. And so uh, I'm just going to touch on two of those. The first debate relates to the applicable legal framework when it comes to arbitration seated in the U.S. So for domestic awards, right, the, the grounds for vacature of an arbitral award are set forth by the Federal Arbitrations, uh, Ar Arbitration Acts Chapter 1. So here I'm not going to go through all of those grounds, but just to give you a sense of what those grounds include, uh, they include that the award was procured by corruption, fraud, or undue means, that there was evident partiality or corruption on the part of the arbitrators, or that the arbitrators exceeded their powers. So these are some examples of the grounds we find under the FAA's Chapter 1. For international arbitrations, we know that the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards applied. So the, the, the New York Convention, you, you may have heard of it. It's uh, one of the most, if not the most uh, uh, successful, I would say, multilateral treaty uh, that, that's been entered into, I think 168 signatories at this point. So the New York Convention or the Panama Convention uh, applied to international, to the enforcement uh, recognition of international uh, arbitral awards. And, and both of those conventions are actually incorporated into uh, chapters two and three of, of the FAA. Now, the New York Convention, for its part, uh, lists a different set of limited conditions under which courts may decide to refuse to enforce or recognize arbitral awards. And those include, and again, I'm just going to give you a bit of a snippet, that the award deals with a dispute that's outside the scope of the party's agreement. Or, and this is a ground you may have heard about often uh, subject uh, to debate, uh, that the recognition or enforcement of the award would be against the public policy of the state where the award is sought to be enforced or recognized. So. These are a few examples, but one ground that I want to draw your attention to uh, is Article 5.1e, uh, which states that the award has been set aside or suspended by a competent authority of the country in which or under the law of which that award was made. That, that'll become important in, in just a second. So from what I just described, it's clear domestic awards, we apply FAA Chapter 1. International awards, we apply the New York Convention or, or Panama Convention. The more difficult question is what standards for vacature apply to non-domestic awards? Uh, so awards that are rendered in the US, but that have some international element. So non-US parties or property outside the US, performance outside the US. The Second Circuit here has actually for some time concluded, uh, since its leading case in, in Yusuf uh, versus Toys R Us, that non-domestic awards fall under the purview of the New York Convention, which by its terms uh, applies to non-domestic awards, but that the New York Convention under its Article 5.1e, the one I pointed you to, uh, itself points to the domestic law of the country where vacature is sought, which in the U.S. would be uh, the FAA's Chapter 1, Grounds for Vacature. So for non-domestic awards, FAA uh, applies. This reasoning was in line with most other circuits in the countries, uh, but not all. And so this is why I'm talking about it today, is that the 11th Circuit had taken the opposite view, saying that the New York Convention, not the FAA Chapter 1 uh, uh, re uh, grounds applied, but uh, the 11th Circuit as of this year has uh, actually changed its stance in a decision called Corporación AIC versus Hidroeléctrica Santa Rita. Now that case uh, dealt with an arbitration between two Guatemalan parties in an ICC arbitration seated in Miami. So exactly as I was saying, a non-domestic arbitration, right? Seated in the US, but two non-US parties. The losing party uh, in that case actually sought to vacate the award on the FAA chapter one basis that the panel had exceeded its powers. So a ground that you could find in the FAA chapter one, but not in the New York convention. And the 11th Circuit, uh, I'll go through this quickly, but the 11th Circuit sitting in bonk 
ultimately overturned its precedent, uh, finding that the New York Convention was not intended to supplant countries' internal arbitration laws, uh, and, and instead that the FAA grounds would apply. Now, while this decision does not have a direct impact uh, on, on cases in New York under the Second Circuit, it's of course an important decision because it brings greater uniformity to, to US courts uh, approach to, to vacating uh, non-domestic awards. But that said, and, and I'll, I'll say this again, because there is a presumption against vacature and it is a rarity, these decisions are very much at the margins, right? The decision will probably not meaningfully change the ultimate likelihood that awards will be vacated. And in fact, in this 11th Circuit case in Corporación AIC, when they remanded the case, the district court uh, denied vacature of the award on the FAA Chapter 1 grounds. Now, the second debate I, I, I just wanted to, to briefly touch on as well is one uh, around this concept of manifest disregard for the law. Now, in addition to the grounds for vacature that are explicitly listed in the FAA, some courts, in, including the Second Circuit, have also recognized a judicially created ground uh, in case of manifest disregard for the law. That's controversial, uh, right, for a number of reasons. One, that it's not explicitly stated in the FAA, but also because the FAA and its case law uh, construing it preclude courts from reviewing the underlying merits of a dispute in, in enforced proceedings and manifest disregard challenges uh, inherently involve some kind of merits review. Um, and so here, the, the interesting case from the Supreme Court was a 2008 decision in Hall Street Associations, where the Supreme Court ruled that the only bases for vacating and arbitral awards are the ones stated in the FAA, but then declined to rule that manifest disregard was dead. So what ensued was another circuit split. Uh, some courts held that Manifest disregard did not apply. Others, including the Second Circuit, upheld that it did. Um, we still have no new Supreme Court uh, case here to report on, but there have been some interesting Second Circuit cases uh, in the meantime on the subject. And one of them is the 2021 case uh, in Seneca Nation of Indians versus State of New York. Now, in that case, the Supreme, uh, not the Supreme Court, the Second Circuit, uh, again, affirmed the validity of manifest disregard, but it also made clear that parties trying to vacate an award under that ground bear a really heavy burden. So succeeding in challenging an award under that ground requires two components, a subjective one and an objective one. Just to give you a sense of how hard it is to, to make this showing, the subjective component uh, includes uh, showing that the arbitrator knew of a relevant legal principle, appreciated that that legal principle controlled here, and then will float, willfully flouted the, the governing law by just ref refusing to apply this principle. So that's the subjective component. And then you also have to show an objective opponent component um, essentially showing that the legal principle was well-defined, it was explicit, and it was clearly applicable. So as you uh, listen to that, you, you probably uh, will get a sense also of why the Second Circuit in that case uh, said that this ground would only apply in exceedingly rare instances. And here I'm quoting, the Second Circuit itself said exceedingly rare, uh, and, and really only where some egregious impropriety on the part of the arbitrator is apparent. So all in all, uh, these cases, uh, including this one, um, point again in, into the direction of where I started, which is that uh, enforcement and recognition of arbitral awards in the US, in New York, is the default. And grounds for vacature or, or non-recognition, non-enforcement are extremely limited. Important foundation as we keep pushing into the enforcement landscape and get into a bit of tricky situation. So let's go with that, Nicole. Um, an award um, once issued is taken to a jurisdiction where it is annulled. That same award then is 
if you call it a second try, but it really depends. National courts come out in different ways, depending on what they're reviewing and what they're allowed to review. They come to the U.S. and or New York and they they get a bite at it. What happens with this Inalda word? Sure, absolutely. So um, the circuits have applied some different standards here as well, um, which I'll get into. But um, I want to start by first thanking Roberta for the um, breakdown on recognition and enforcement and vacatur. And I also wanted to um, just bookmark a, a small thing, which is that sometimes uh, Reka referred to annulment, um, Roberta referred to vacatur, sometimes is referred to as set aside. So there's these <laughs> words that are different that they essentially mean the same thing. I'm not sure why the arbitration community decide to confuse us in this way, but if you hear either of these three words, basically the same concept. Um, so I think that this has been one of the most interesting developments in the last few years um, in the enforcement space. I'll first talk about a case from 2017 in the DC circuit called uh, Getma International versus Republic of Guinea. Um, Getma was a French company that had a contract with Guinea, which the um, Republic terminated. Getma brought an international arbitration in response to the termination and prevailed in that arbitration. Guinea then brought an action to set aside the arbitral award in an African court, which did set aside the award based primarily on the fact that the, arbitra the arbitrators failed to apply certain mandatory fee provisions in their decision. Um, Getma then applied to the District Court of the District of Columbia in the U.S. to enforce the original award that they won despite the set aside by the African court. Um, but DDC declined to enforce and um, the D.C. Circuit affirmed that denial on appeal. The standard that the court applied was whether the annulment was, quote, repugnant to fundamental notions of what is decent and just in the United States, which is a very high bar. Um, the DC court acknowledged that setting aside an arbitral award based on failure to apply proper fee provisions may seem harsh and many arbitral seats may not have reached the same decision, but it didn't rise to the level of being repugnant to proper notions of justice in the United States. Therefore, in respect of international comedy, the court wouldn't ignore the annulment of the African court. Now, the Second Circuit has also used the same standard and did use the same standard in 2016 in the case Comisa versus Pemex. But this case came out the other way with the court actually enforcing the annulled award. Comisa obtained an arbitral award in its favor arising out of a contract with Pemex to build oil platforms. SDNY then recognized the award in the United States. After that, a Mexican court set aside the award on the basis of a new Mexican law saying that entities of the Mexican government, such as Pemex, cannot be forced to arbitrate. Pemex then applied, uh, appealed SDNY's recognition of the award on the grounds that it had been set aside in Mexico. Um, but the Second Circuit declined to overturn the recognition. Um, the Second Circuit held this was a case where that high bar of repugnancy was surpassed because the Mexican law protecting government entities from arbitration was passed after the parties had contracted for arbitration, making its application retroactive, which, as you know, retroactive ap application of new laws is something that U.S. courts consistently have policies against. Um, that's not to say, though, that the Second Circuit is always inclined to ignore set-asides. More recently, in a 2017 case, Thai Lao Lignite v. Laos, the Second Circuit refused to enforce an award annulled by a court in Malaysia 
even though as in Camisa, the case that I just described, the set aside happened after the U.S. court's initial recognition of the award. Um, the difference in circumstances here included that the Malaysian set aside did not strip the parties of an opportunity to be heard. Um, the Malaysian court actually issued um, an order to re-arbitrate the dispute, and I'll get into that into, uh, in a second. Um, and the Malaysian court didn't rely on suspect or retroactive applicable laws to set aside that award. Um, the Malaysian court set aside the award because in its view, the arbitral tribunal decided certain claims that were not actually within its jurisdiction, which as you remember is one of the grounds for set aside that Roberta mentioned, but it also ordered a re-arbitration as I mentioned. So these circumstances did not violate um, fundamental notions of justice in the US um, in the view of the second circuit. Um, aside from the DC and the Second Circuit, um, only the Tenth Circuit has also spoken on this question um, in a very, very recent decision, um, January 2023, um, in a decision uh, called GCC. Um, in that case, the Tenth Circuit upheld the enforcement of an award. Um, after a, a subsequent set aside by a Bolivian court. Um, the Tenth Circuit cited the fundamental U.S. public policy favoring finality of awards um, with which it considered the Bolivian annulment conflicted. Um, this is because the Bolivian courts had on numerous occasions before and after the U.S.'s recognition of the award declined to set aside the award, but GCC kept asking them to set it aside until one Bolivian court did. Um, the Second Circuit said that this violated the U.S. policy of finality. Um, so what does this all mean for the U.S. and the New York court's desirability for arbitral parties? Well, there is certainly room to argue for enforcement of an annulled award, but it is still quite a high bar. Um, parties might rather choose a jurisdiction like France in which to seek enforcement of awards um, that have been annulled instead, where the courts tend to routinely enforce arbitral awards that have been annulled at the seat of the arbitration. Um, but it remains to be seen what the remaining U.S. circuits will do. We may very well end up with another circuit split that requires SCOTUS intervention, and that is always fun to watch, so we will see what happens there, too. Um, so, sorry, Nicole, thank you. We're very mindful of time. I just want to, Hiroko, if you can, sort of rapid speed, just close us out on any quick button enforcement issues that our crowd needs to know before we close out here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll quickly just flag for you three issues, and I'm happy to talk more about it after the session formally ends. But um, so hot topic issues about enforcement. Uh, the first one is sanctions. The second one is RICO or racketeering. And the third one is post-judgment interest. I'll just quickly flag um, what those issues are about. So for sanctions, um, you can see that when you're trying to enforce against a party for, um, that has sanctions against them, that could become an issue. Like, is that does that conflict with the sanctions that are regulations or does it not? So generally, the U.S. has taken a more liberal approach in recognizing arbitral awards despite sanctions being issued against the award debtor. And in this respect, one exciting development that just happened this week is that Venezuela has been sub um, has for years been subject to sanctions, and there are billions of dollars worth of awards against. Venezuela or its state-owned entities that have been issued. And through a variety of um, actors and the U.S. Office of Foreign Asset Control being very heavily in involved, the U.S. District Court for Delaware started the auction process to sell sh uh, shares that are owned by a Venezuelan national oil and gas company that are in the U.S. So one exciting development there. Um, the second one is related to RICO. So uh, RICO is traditionally for racketeering, you would think about organized crimes, and that's usually the context in it, which it appears. The Supreme Court case in June 2023, Yegazarian and Smagin, ruled that because the, the award deb debtor tried to get out of paying the arbitral award worth $80 million plus dollars, um, through a concocted, you know, fraudulent kind of activity that they would be subject to RICO, which is a, a real landmark decision. And then the third one is post-judgment interest. So um, 
interest is just an issue that people have as an afterthought, but it could have real practical consequences when you're talking about uh, enforcing an arbitral award. And in, on this one, I just flagged that there's some split in district court decisions in the DDC and the SDNY as to what language the, the arbitral tribunal has to use to make their post-award interest rate a apply even after the award is enforced in the U.S. as a judgment and it becomes a judgment. Um, so that, those are three issues to watch. That was an elevator pitch from Hiroko. Really, those are dense topics that each needed to be broken out. I want to leave you with um, just the concepts for the future. We won't get into them, certainly after and at the cocktail hour, things to think about. But implications to arbitration for the future and forward thinking include the pandemic, include ESG and how those disputes are coming out. What are the rules that regulate them um, and climate change overall? And then of course, crypto, which is embedded in the VIS problem, I believe this year as well. And so how do we deal with crypto and cyber attacks and other issues by and large? Things to think about. But before we conclude, we have to go back to our polling question to see where we stand. So the polling question that we started as a bookend at the start of this was, are the US or New York courts becoming more or less pro-arbitration over the past decade? So we ask it again, pro, becoming more pro-arbitration, becoming less arbitration. Let's go with more first, hands up. Okay, and less pro-arbitration? The majority is still ruling in favor of the more pro arbitration. So um, there you have it with lots of nuances um, and threads. I wanna thank our speakers. They really prepared phenomenal amounts of content. Do look at your CLE materials. The final word, because we need three in the CLE coding. So it was New York, New York and arbitration culminates it all. With that, join me in giving a round of applause to our speakers. And to Peter and to everyone online, many friends, thank you so much for joining. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Rekha. Thank, we're just so honored that you would agree to spend your evening with us. Thank you tremendously for, for your help. Thank you very much for coming and we'll see you uh, on the 15th uh, of November for our next program. Thanks again. Thank you, phenomenal. Yeah, all right, I know. Whoa, hot. <laughs>